Uh, the topic is a little bit different from the other ones we discussed until now. We are dealing with the advances of ultra high resolution MRI for one aspect, one side of the prognosis factor, which is the analysis and the evaluation of the extent of the disease. And you know that the, the extent of the disease in several conditions is really very, very important. Uh, in this case, for example, here we have the extent of the disease from the primary side along the perineural spread, and you see that there is the involvement of the cavernous sinus and the spread of this disease along the greater petrosal superficial nerve. Well, why, this, why discussing this point? Because I would like to address uh, one part of the head and neck field, that is the part where the uh, involvement or the sparing of the small structures uh, that are very important for the anatomy, I mean mostly the uh, arteries and the nerves, does really influence the treatment planning. And second, uh, these are areas where the surgical field may have critical constraints as in uh, most advanced endoscopic approaches. So you understand that I will uh, like to address the point of the paranasal sinuses and the involvement of the skull base. And uh, when, when this technique has been used, when we have to evaluate both benign and malignant neoplasts, and why? Because we are close or we are inside the skull base where standard MR sequences may fail to precisely demonstrate and map the key anatomic structure and the tumor boundaries. This is very important. Therefore, the concept is the high resolution volumetric approach. That means isotropic volume acquisition like NCT for MA, meaning that all voxels within the volume have the same size. We can therefore cut in different planes and extract new anatomy in any direction of the space. The resolution can reach 600 micron or 500 microns, and the constant resolution can be mostly uh, related to a T2 weighted sequence uh, where the uh, CSF is hyper intense or T1 where the CSF is hypo. In both cases, using uh, sequences originally developed for the cystenography, it is the use of contrast agent that will help you to identify vessel and structure. As you can see, this is an endolymphatic sac tumor, and you can see that the same anatomy can be displaced. The CSF is bright and the, and the nerve is black and can be identified, and the, the tumor will enhance after the contrast agent administration also on this systemographic approach. And finally, the final step will be uh, to discuss how these uh, different volumes can be fused pro to provide additional information. Uh, being uh, still in the technical part, this is part of the conventional study. This, was, this is a young patient with a complex teratoma and the planning of the very large tumor will consider the part of the lesion extended at the level of the skull base and the changes in the macular cave and also the changes in the soft tissues and the presence of a collection that is located very close to the eustachian tube. This is to demonstrate that this type of high resolution technique can help you to demonstrate in the follow up that for the patient you have this uh, uh, sack of uh, fluid that is infected and you have the connection with the eustachian tube that is located over there. Well, what about the technique? In the standard sequence we are using, we, uh, when we're addressing lesion close to the skull base, we use the volume interpolated breath hold technique with the isotropic, with the possibility of covering 12 centimeters in four minutes. And we are dealing with skull based lesion. We also adopt the CIS sequence after contrast agent, again a 3D sequence uh, with uh, coverage limited to 50 uh, millimeter. Again, the price is more than four minutes. And uh, the example is this. Uh, though this is a sequence that is mostly systemography, therefore the bright signal coming from T2 weighted, but it is possible if you know before and after contrast agent that we will, will have enhancement of the cavernous sinus and enhancement of the venous plexus, the capillary plexus along the clivus. Well, this is a residual 
uh, of the not accord, it is uh, echordosis fissilifera. Therefore, the hourglass appearance of this lesion is located partially inside the sphenoisinus, CSF leak, and uh, meningitis was the problem of this patient, partially inside the intracranial aspect. And you see that the sixth nerve can be demonstrated before and after contrast agent. In this case, it is a volumetric approach. Therefore, sagittal, pre, and sagittal post accounts for the appearance of the uh, hourglass image of, the, of this lesion. Before contrast agent, the hypothesis cannot be separated from the floor of the, of the cell, and this can be imaged because of the different signal between the two structures. It is a volumetric uh, image acquisition, therefore, if you orient your plane now along the path of the sixth nerve, you see that you can detect the position and the spatial relationship of the fissilifera uh, with the sixth nerve on both sides. And this, uh, it is very useful if you are planning, as it was done in this case, an uh, endonasal approach. The same technique can give you information about the area which is a very critical area, the cavernosinus, that we are at the level of the posterior clinal process. We have the optic tract over there, the optic recess, the system for the third nerve. You follow the third nerve inside the cavernosinus. You follow also some of the ligaments that in the normal patient can be demonstrated. Moving from this point posterior in the cella to a more anterior point, you can uh, also see the chiasm and the optic nerve, and uh, other, the, the anterior clinus is over there, the superior orbital fissure, and if you follow the superior orbital fissure, the third nerve is there, and the other nerves along the lateral part of the uh, cavernous sinus can be detected. This is not a normal patient, but instead it is a patient with a schwannoma, that is located close to the area of the foramen ovale. It is actually um, modifying the size of the foramen ovale and displacing uh, the third branch of the trigeminal nerve. Well, this type of approach can be used also in malignant tumor. This one is a tumor that spread into the, in, through the superorbital fissure along the third nerve. You see the tumor arise, arose from the skin and uh, the patient refused to have the exenteration of the orbit, and then uh, the tumor uh, was following the optic nerve and reaching the apex of the orbit, and you can see that at this time also, if you compare the right side and the left side of the third nerve, you can see that there is a difference in signal, and the patient uh, received surgery reaching this area. A similar approach, I mean uh, the demonstration of the uh, structure located at this level of the central skull base is present in this uh, hypovisial tumor that is mostly uh, characterized by the involvement of the bones. You know perfectly this is the foramen ovale and the tumor is invading the bone and it is modifying the position of the cistern. So again, here we can detect the third and the abnormal position of the third, not only on the coronal plane, but using, again, this 3D approach, you can also provide information about the low signal you pack like a plexiglass, large five or six millimeter, and then you can follow the, the path of the third nerve, which is hyperintense, and of the posterior communicating artery, and describe the relationship and understand why the system of the third has been retracted toward the skull base. Similar approach if you are planning a naso endoscopic resection as a salvage procedure in case of a recurrent adenocystic carcinoma at the level of the foramen lacerum. You see the internal carotid artery. You see again the structure that points to, toward the central skull base. The third is located uh, close to this point. And you also see this is the third on one side and the third on the other side, and also the variation like in this fetal arrangement uh, of the uh, pol polygon or willis that can be demonstrated by imaging. The other technique is the technique where we are not addressing the cystenography, but we are looking for the high signal coming from the gadolinium. The, in this technique, we are dealing with a juvenile angiofibroma, 
the juvenile recurrent algae fibroma is again spreading and involving the foramen lacerum. You see that uh, this is the third nerve, which is a black signal running through this cavernous sinus that can be detected on the axle. Then you pick up the same volume, you rearrange the volume, you have the third nerve over there and the third nerve in the other position. If you move down, you can also, even in this case, detect the sixth nerve, and which has been displaced by the uh, residual uh, juvenile angiofibroma post-surgery that is uh, uh, displacing also the muscle of the, the inferior retus muscle at this level. So we are at the level of the inferior and superior orbital fissure. And if you move again, we see that on the normal side, we have the second branch on the trigeminal nerve. On the other side, we have the Meckel cave displaced by the tumor. And this high resolution techniques shows two linear hyper intense structure that are there. And these are the two structures. So the sagittal point at this level shows second branch of the trigeminal nerve. If you rearrange the plan of reconstruction of, at this level, you see again the second branch of the trigeminal nerve, which has been displaced and uh, displaced laterally um, by means of the residual tumor. This technique can also apply to the assessment of the involvement of the orbit by means of the tumor. This is a neuroendocrine uh, paranasal sinusus tumor that will displace the, uh, the uh, middle orbital wall. You can see that this in FATSAT sequence, there is actually the enhancement at this level. There are two parts of the medial wall of the orbit. One has been displaced, the other is a cell, ethmoidal cell. You see that uh, anteriorly, you have just one uh, layer of enhancement. Posteriorly, you have two layers of enhancement. One is inside the cell, the other one is outside and in between, like in a sandwich, the ham corresponds to the lamella of the bone. So no, you know now that there is displacement, and this one is the periorbiter, which show enhancement, not present on the opposite orbit. And, the, and if you go posteriorly, you see that there is enhancement of the periorbiter, and there is enhancement of the mucosa investing the ethmoidal cell. So this can, this can give you information about the relationship of the tumor with, uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the orbit. The last example is regarding uh, the combination of the multiple volume. This one is uh, chondrosarcoma, myxoid chondrosarcoma that has been partially treated uh, a week ago. I was in the OR with a with surgeon and through the endoscopic approach. The question and the project was, we have to control the left carotid artery, which is the last uh, least involved artery. So this is a cone beam computer tomography uh, with a patient lying down, 200 micron. This is 550, this is 600, this is 500. You can use the open source uh, software to uh, register, register all those images. Then you can have the, the bone overlap to the cis sequence with the gadolinium. And you see the carotid artery is over there. If you also fuse the time of flight with the vessel, you know, understand where is the right mostly involved carotid artery, where is the left, and where is the part of the lesion uh, in, inside the cervelopontine angle. If you use the same volume and you re-cut uh, the volume in the coronal plane, this is the right coronal uh, internal carotid artery. This is the intracavernous part. This is outside the cavernous sinus. The third is there. The Meckel cave has been displaced, and particularly important, this is the way the left car carotid artery has been displaced, and this was rejected by endoscopic surgery at that moment. And then the second part of the treatment, uh, we leave surely residual tumor that should be treated by means of the carbon ion radiation therapy. This is the axial plane. Again, you see where is the internal carotid artery on this side and also the relationship of the tumor with the fifth, the trigeminal nerve, its uh, portion has been displayed by, displaced by this uh, tumor growing inside uh, and beyond the cerebellum pontine angle. Therefore, uh, a take home message is that complex surgical procedure 
as those addressing tumor in the skull base may benefit from a thorough demonstration of the key anatomy and tumor boundaries. And the volumetric high resolution techniques may improve pretreatment planning. Thank you very much for attention.